All right, so we are looking today at the war zone of sanctification. And I, I call it a war zone because that's exactly what it is, right? We, we so often minimize the spiritual battle that is raging. And we unfortunately prepare for it like a flag football game instead of the life and death contest that it truly is, right? So when we, when we hear things from Scripture like the, the devil is a lion who prowls about roaring, looking for those whom he can destroy, right? Or Jesus saying to, to Peter, the, the evil one ha wants to sift you like wheat, right? But I have prayed for you. These are not just things of, okay, well, we need, we need a little spiritual pep talk and go out and, and do a good job. No, we, we are engaged in mortal combat. And it is folly for us to either ignore that or not prepare for that, right? And so as we're walking through Westminster Confession of Faith, this is not just a, an exercise of, okay, how well do you know your theology? How, you know, can we dot all the I's and cross all the T's? These are things that are vitally important for us to better understand God's holy word, what it teaches us about the reality of the, the battle that we're engaged in, and how we can actually prepare for that battle the war has already been won with Christ on the cross and the resurrection, right? But the battles still rage. And so we want to and need to be prepared for those things. And I want you to see this connection uh, between these three things that we've been talking about. Justification. Adoption. and sanctification. Because so often in all, you know, all that we've gotten before these three things are the foundation, are the things that, that make these things possible, right? For us to understand a holy, righteous God who cannot abide sin for a nanosecond, right? Because he is holy and just, he is absolutely perfect, his righteousness demands that to be in fellowship with him, we must be perfect as he is perfect, right? That foundation of who God is and understanding him as Father and Son and Holy Spirit, all three of which are engaged in the rescue of his people and all that's involved in those things. And that this justification is an act of God a declarative judicial act where he declares his people righteous because of the perfect finished work of Jesus, right? And that that's a one-time declarative act that he says, you are not only not guilty, but you are righteous. And that that work and that act and that declaration has already been done, already been accomplished, and we have that fully and entirely in Christ but that it doesn't stop there, that he also adopts us and takes us in to his family, right? This is not the story of the judge who looks at the, the criminal and says, okay, I, I declare all of your crimes null and void and you're a citizen in good standing, right? Now, run along, right? But rather the judge comes down off the bench and takes the criminal home, gives him a room, gives him his name, all of, all of those things that we saw last week with adoption. And then, because we are justified and adopted, he begins his work in making us experientially righteous as well as declared righteous, right? This righteousness is an alien righteousness imputed to us. An alien righteousness that is imputed to us. God takes us, washes us of our sin, gives us his righteousness, imputed into us, made, we are made new creatures. And that's the new reality of who we are. 
that, that can never be changed, that can never be undone, right? We're declared righteous. But that righteousness is not our own righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness given to us. And so this adoption leads us into the family of God where that righteousness is then working in us and through us to conform us more and more into that image of Christ so that we would, by our actions, more and more resemble our position, right? That we would have that in experience what we have in point of fact through what Christ has done. Does that make sense? All right, so turn your sheet over to the back. I want us to look at these two passages in Romans that are working out some of these specifics of, of how this work of sanctification happened. Because, and I'm going to give you some fancy uh, Latin words um, uh, to, to go along with this. Okay, so justification is mono. What does that mean? What's Uno, right? Erg, ergonomics, work, right? Justification is monergistic. It is one working, right? God alone does all of the work, not some, not most, all of the work for our justification. Whereas sanctification, on the other hand, is sin, not sin as in evil, but sin with a Y, together. together. Work, right? Working together, okay? Synergistic is the work of salvation, or sanctification, rather. It's a big, big slip, right? Monergistic salvation. God alone doing everything to accomplish our, accompli uh, our, our justification. Sanctification, rather, is synergistic. It is us working together with God, right? So that we work in tandem. We work along with Him in our sanctification, in our being made holy, in our experiencing that. So when, when you wake up in the morning, right, and, and you feel that little, little conscience voice in the back of your head saying, hey, it's a new day. God's given us this day. Why don't you praise him for it? And you think, mm, coffee. Right? That there's, a, there's a choice there. Right? If you are in Christ, you are already saved from your caffeine idolatry. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> uh, or Diet Coke idolatry, whichever it might be. Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, now you're, we're already saved from that. We didn't have to work away from that addiction or that idolatry in order to be saved. He's done it alone, right? But our walking in that righteousness, our obeying in actual time and space, not in order to get into the family, not in order to get saved, but because we are saved and because we are God's people, and as his children, we want to do what the Father would have us to do, right? Then, then we make choices and along together with God, with the Holy Spirit, seek to do the right things. We seek to obey him. And that's that's real choice that we really have in real time to, to choose to do these things that God would have us to do, okay? So those are very different things between our working together with God in sanctification versus Him alone working in our justification. Now, folks will say, well, but wait a minute. To do this, I had to make a choice, right? I had to, to agree with God. That's, that's what confession is, right? Agreeing with God. And that, that's absolutely true. And why and how did you do that? Because of the gracious work of God. Right? So he has declared you holy. He has declared you his. And so, yes, you did, if you have, agree with God, confess your sins, turn from them, and trust in Christ. Okay? So, 
So this ongoing work of sanctification, this is, this is where we're living out all of these things, right? And so that, that's where the battle comes, right? Because what we find in justification is that God has given us new birth. He's given us a new creation, a, a heart with which to love God. He, he begot, uh, yes, whatever the present term of begot is, right? That, that that's, we're new. But the scripture tells us that we continue to battle with what the scripture strangely calls the old man, right? Our own old desires. The scripture also talks about it as the flesh, sarcos, right? This, this fleshly way in which we have our entire life rebelled against God. And even though we have a new man within us, we still battle with that old man, right? That old way of rebelling against God, finding our own way, making a name for ourselves, all, all those things. And so this sanctification is this battle within us where we've got a new person, right? A, a reborn new life within us that is wanting to follow God, that is wanting to please Him, that is wanting to obey Him, that's wanting to do what's right, to give God the glory rather than seeking our own glory. While at the same time, this old fleshly way of deal, dealing with things that's resisting that, right? That's why there are snooze buttons on alarms. Right? No, no, another another five minutes, right? So this this wrestling is what the scripture deals with. So let's look at these two passages that you've got on your notes. Who would like to read that first one, Romans six, one to four? You can read that out real loud for us. Okay? Great, thanks so much. All right, so there again we see this contrast painted by the Scripture as life and death, right? That, that even though if we've trusted in Christ and, and found salvation in Him, this justification piece, right, we are made new, we are born again, we have this new life within us, while at the same time still battling with the old flesh, right? And he says things like, uh, we were baptized into Christ's death. What is, that, what is that talking about? Or that we were, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too live a new life. If we're united with him in this death, we'll certainly be united with him in the, his resurrection, right? So that, that through justification, right, we, we come through justification and die to sin and death. That, that at the cross, what we're doing is being united with Christ 
in his death, right? And, and thereby, not only is the penalty for sin paid, but our, our slavery to death is broken, right? Through death, if, if, if you're a slave to somebody else and you die, the slave master doesn't go and take your corpse and continue to have it work the work that you were doing, right? You're delivered out of that slavery through death. You're no longer required to be a slave to that thing anymore, right? So we have this union with Christ in his death, but also in his resurrection, so that as Jesus is raised on Easter Sunday, he's raised to resurrection life. And in that, we are united with him in his death and also in life, so now we have this newness of life. We, we have the freedom from sin and death because of this newness in life that we have. But he continues to say that we need to die, right, to ourselves as we go forward. There's this ongoing continual death. This is what the, the Puritans called the mortification of the flesh. Right? What does it mean to mortify, mortician, to put to death our flesh? Well, here's some of how that looks, right? So when I am tempted by my old flesh, right, to harbor resentment against people who have hurt me, right? So things come up, somebody says something. Right? That reminds me of some hurt that I've had in the past. Right? And I have the choice of, well, do I, do I feed that? Right? Do I entertain that temptation to say, what a bozo. That, that person, ugh. Uh, I can't believe that they, you know, and to go through that in my mind. Right? And to it, mentally take out the little voodoo doll and just stick pins in that. Right? Because there's something that feeds my flesh, right, by, by doing that. Because part of what it does is says, I'm not that bad. This person is bad, right? But instead of feeding that, which is actually death, right, the, the, the bitterness, the anger, the, all of those things directed at somebody else, Many times, somebody that I've, I've forgiven, I've said, no, no, I'm not going to hold that against you. you. You're forgiven of that thing, but I'm still tempted to bring that baby out, right? And stick those pins in it, right? But to say, no, I'm going to die to that flesh. I'm going to put that temptation to death, right? And that's, that can be painful. It's a choice to say, nope, I'm not going there, right? and to choose instead life, right? So the, the alternate to, uh, vivic or to mortification is vivification, right? To give life. Help me, hon. C. -A How's that? Okay. See, it's, it's hard when you're on a whiteboard that doesn't have autocorrect, right? So Kristen's got to help me out. To, so if I, if I put to death the deeds of the flesh, again, that's not enough, yeah. right? That what we find in the Scripture is constantly, and I'll get there, what I find in the Scripture constantly is not only don't do the deeds of evil, but don't do them and instead do do the things of life. Do do what God is supposed to. Right? That, that that's the, the fullness of what we get in sanctification. Is that I'm saying, no, I won't obey my own desires for 
justification, my own desires for making myself feel better, my stoking my own ego, my doing all of those things. I'm going to say no to those deeds of death and yes instead to the things that give life, right? So that that person, instead of sticking pins in the doll, that I might pray for that person, that I might look to help that person, that when other co-workers who've also been hurt by that person, right, go to the water cooler or the coffee pot and, and they've got the, the, the little, you know, office doll, right, because everybody is upset by that person and everybody comes and takes turns sticking pins in them for you to say, no, I'm not going to stick a pin in them and in fact, I'm actually going to defend them, right? You say, how do you defend the creep? Right? Everything that they're saying is true. Yep. And, and everything that the devil has said to Jesus about me is true. But Jesus comes to my defense. When, when the devil comes and says, look at Doug. He, he thinks he's a pastor, but look at all this stuff. Jesus doesn't come and say, well, let's see, weigh, let's weigh Doug's good things against his bad things. No, he doesn't do any of that. What he does is he comes and says to Satan, he's mine. Right? So one of the ways that we can defend people that other people are tearing down is to acknowledge what is true about them. That's someone made in the image of God. That's someone who is due honor and respect and dignity, not necessarily because of anything that they've done, but because they're a human being. Right? Now, we can do that in a haughty, moralistic, pharisaic way, right? Well, I'm not going to involve myself in office gossip, and you shouldn't either. You know, that shows no grace of the gospel, right? But there are other ways that we can come alongside and, and diffuse those kinds of things and say things like, you know, I've, I've been just as guilty of those things as, as that person is. You're, you're absolutely right to say that that was wrong. Yep, that, that was wrong. And I've, I've done wrong just like that. Boy, I, if you're upset at that person for what they did, then you ought to be upset at me for the things that I've done. And I, I sure hope you'd forgive me. I'm, I'm just as guilty as they are. And the only way that I can even sleep with myself at night, knowing what I've done, is because of the grace that I've received through Christ. Right? To mortify the flesh, to put it to death, not to just say, okay, I'm, 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 I'm not going to play with you. Right? That, that's, that is the start. But to go all the way and say, no, I'm, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. And then. Um, going around mortifying the flesh oftentimes can be akin to, I'm not going to think that thought that I want to think. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, the Men's Fellowship sponsored a, a seminar series for those men who wanted to, uh, to escape the bondage of the sexual addiction. Mm -hmm. And one thing that they learned in there was is you don't go around saying, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to look, I'm not going to do, because, because your mind is so focused on it. You're right. Look. And so it takes us back to um, the second half of that is, is not just simply uh, uh, mortify the flesh, but walk by the Spirit. Right. And so that um, you feed the Spirit. Mm -hmm. And um, sanctification is funny in that... Um, <clears throat> God blesses us with the desire to be sanctified. We work through the sanctification process whereby we have a greater desire to be sanctified. Mm -hmm. And so that, uh, in my mind, um, mortifying the flesh has less to do with, it, it has to do with being obedient, mm -hmm. but it has more to do with walking by the Spirit. Mm -hmm. The Men's Fellowship also did something a couple years ago about what that means to walk by the Spirit. Right. And that, that, Instead of getting up and saying, yeah, I really should study the Bible. Mm -hmm. uh, right. It's more of, Father, before I put my feet on the ground, I want to do your will today. 
Mm -hmm. I want to be, give you joy, I want to be at peace with you, and that kind of stuff. So right. To me, that's what mortification of the flesh is, and sanctification is. It's less about what not to do and more about what to do. Right. Yeah, it, it's both and. These, we've got to have both. Right, that, that we see this in our Savior's refusal of sin when the devil comes and tempts him. Right, He says no to what the devil is offering and yes to what the Father had said. Right? It's, it's both and. Right? Dying to self, no, I'm, I'm not going to take the easy route, the shortcut, to get what would be helpful to me, right? but I'm going to do it the way that the Father has said, and, and doing that. And that the Holy Spirit, of course, is the one that God, Christ has given us to enable us to do both. To die to sin and to live to Christ. To Christ right? That's, that's what the Spirit's doing. Right. Right. Yep. And that um, the, the resolution of that, uh, the beginning resolution of that, I feel like I'm just starting to experience, mm -hmm. is that the mortification of the flesh is actually the work of the Spirit in my life. Right. It is not my capability. I am not capable mm -hmm. as a sinner of mortifying. Right. And that that's where the good news comes in. Yeah. This is the grace right. of Christ. Right. And how much um, I am frustrated by what I hear sometimes in the broader evangelical church, which still sounds like just work harder. Right. Do more, go up more. Do this more often, do that more often, do this more often. Right. And it still feels like a burden. Right, right. And that's, that's exactly why I'm showing you this connection between these things, right? So that it's precisely where I'm, I'm struggling even to do this part, let alone get to the vivification part, right? Is, is I'm, I'm, I'm here and I realize, no, I, I really want that thing. Right? And I'm unable to stop doing that thing. Right? And, and so how do, I, how do I even do that? To understand and, and come back to the gospel that says, I'm not here because of anything in me. Right? The, the good news is what I continue to need to preach to myself and to others. Right? Is, is that I didn't get into this family by, based on anything that I've done. And so often that's the lie of the enemy is to make us feel trapped to make us feel so awful because what a hypocrite you are right and the gospel says you're absolutely right we every one of us are hypocrites right praise be to god the fa the father has sent the son to deliver us from our own hypocrisy right that christ is our only hope and that is good news so now, because I've already died with Christ, and I've already been raised with him, now as a child of the king, Lord, help me to want to do what you would have me to do. Right? Because again, it's not just behavior. It's I can do all the right things and be utterly hollow and dead inside. Right? So help me to not only do the right things, but to want to do the right things out of love for you. Give me that desire. Purify that desire. Now, my desire is there, but my flesh is weak. So strengthen my flesh, right? Enable me to do these things, right? I know we've got a couple questions. Let's, let's move on and look at, at Romans 7, and then, we'll, and then we'll circle back around, okay? Somebody want to read for me that portion from Romans 7? Thanks. Good and loud. I know that nothing good lives in me, that is, 
No, the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in the sinful nature a slave to the law of sin. Great. So one of the things I want us to be to see here very clearly, right, is that Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is describing his own experience, but he's also describing his own experience that is a model for what we all experience in this struggle if we've been born again and then still have the, this war within us, okay? So it is not the experience of someone who's never come to Christ, right? Although it certainly begins to feel more like that if the Holy Spirit is drawing someone to himself and they're beginning to be revived and awake and, and, and know the things of God and are, are starting to feel conviction perhaps for the first time, right? But, but this is as he's come to Christ, in Christ, this is the battle and struggle that, that he has, okay? And it's not that he just has low self-image, right? This, this is not going to be fixed right, by him just believing more positively, right, or, or thinking happy thoughts, right? He's, he's talking about this and relating this experience and drives this to the point where he says, wretched man that I am, who can deliver me, right? The, the point of this is that there is only one source of deliverance, Right? That just as Christ is the only way that we can be brought into the family of God, justified and made holy, that, that he is the only one who can provide us ongoing freedom in this walk to, to die to ourself and to live for the Spirit. Right? That, we have to understand that Christ alone is the only one who can enable us to live in this way. Heidi, you had something? Yeah, um, when I think of synergistic work, you know, our work with God and sanctification, what, what immediately strikes me is the battle starts here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we are in a war. Right. This is, this is war language. Yep. It starts here. So, you know, I've always said, God, you know, help me understand a little bit more. Pray without ceasing. Mm -hmm. Because obviously we have lives and children take care of each other. So we can't be on our knees. Yep, we, right. Sure. So, so the reality is, is that there's, there's a basis of this that's very simple, right? That, that's not complicated at all, right? To live in Christ is to live. To be in anything else is to die, right? It, it's that simple. It's that black and white, right? But the way that it gets worked out in our lives is incredibly complex, right? So that the scripture tells us things like renew your mind, right? Hide God's word within your heart, right? That, that there's this battle that goes on in terms of your mind, that area of knowledge, of knowing the things of God, that is necessary to combat the false things of the devil, the world, and our flesh, right? The, the battle for righteousness and sin lived out in our life is very much something that we need the knowledge of God to, to decipher what is false and leads to death and what is true, right? So there's a knowledge part that, that we need God's truth to set us free. There's also a piece in terms of our heart, right, that, that he, he, Lord, give me an undivided heart, right? So the battle is one of my mind. It's also a battle of my heart. Right? I can know all of the right stuff. 
and yet be cold in my affections for Christ. So Jonathan Edwards talks a lot about the affections, right, of, of us setting our affections upon Christ, that, that that is so vital. Now, to do that well, we need the knowledge, right? So again, think of this in terms of relationship. As you're getting to know that special someone that you're just gaga over, right, you want to know everything about them. And the more that you learn about them, the better able you are to love them as they actually are and not just as you would like them to be, right? That, those, that knowledge and heart affection go hand in hand. But it's also not just knowledge and affection, it's also our will, right? Am I choosing to do the hard work that's necessary to love this person in the ways that they need to be loved? Right? And so there are all these different overlays of, yes, our mind and our, our hearts and our will. Right? And so Christ talks about this in his word about us as a whole people. Right? That, that we would, through our whole person, resemble Christ. And that's what actually is happening in sanctification. So to be sanctified is to be set apart. So the scripture talks about sanctification as opposed to common use. In our house, we have a, a, a way that this works itself out. We have, because of great blessing from God, we have not just enough dishes for our whole family to use, but we have the regular ordinary dishes, but we also have china, the formal dishes, right? That, that we use for special occasions. We have one plate that's, that says, you are loved, that is particularly a plate that whoever's birthday it is gets to have their meal on, right? And that plate is, is in the china cabinet and it only comes out on birthdays. It is set apart. If when it goes through the dishwasher, whoever's unloading the dishwasher just puts it in with all the other plates, right? It, it's, it's being made common, right? That it could be used for, for every day, whatever, right? And then someone will notice, hey, this red plate in with all the white plates, that doesn't belong there. They take it out, they set it apart for its special use, right? And that doesn't mean that we're sanctified or we're set apart to be away from the world and not to have any interaction with the world. No, we're to be in the world but not of the world. What it means for us to be sanctified is, is that we're set apart for God's holy, special use. That we're children of the King, we're adopted by Him, and that we're part of this family business that is a unique thing in all the world. It's not the common, ordinary, everyday use. Even though we are living in everyday use, we are set apart. We've been made holy in Christ, and now we are to be making, being made holy in, in that everyday use for extraordinary purposes. Does that make sense? <laughs> okay, lots of things. Go ahead. Yep. And it's something that was incredibly helpful to me, which is um, I came upon this thing that talked about being married to the law or married to Christ. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, now I get it. Right, yep. And how I was married to the law. Mm -hmm. And that that was where the you know, self condemnation came out of you know, not living up to. Right. And that married to Christ, not only did it help me to understand that, but it helps me to understand the importance of working with the person I'm married to. Right. Um, and that it also really helped me understand the church. Yeah. And about the work, like when the whole image of Christ um, and the church as his bride. Mm -hmm. Right, right. So how does that get played out? So let me, because again, the, these things, 
they, they dwell right together, and it's so often that we, we mistake them, right? So, so uh, give me a, a vice, something that you, as Christians we're not supposed to do. Gambling. Huh? Gambling. Gambling, okay. So, so and we're not, we're not saying that you should never gamble. We're not saying that the biblical thing is again, all again. We're just saying that that's often held up as something, okay, you're not to gamble. So, so in my house growing up, my great-grandmother married a Baptist missionary who, who took you're not supposed to gamble, meaning that you're not, never ever supposed to have cards, right? Cards are of the devil, right? And so if you have a, a deck of cards in your home, you know, just watch out because he's coming for you, right? Okay, and, and so if, if I internalize that as, okay, I'm justified by God, I'm adopted, and, and so I'm living this out, and, and that means that, Christians cannot gamble or even have cards, right? And so I'm, I'm seeking to follow Christ, and so I burn all my cards, right? We have a little ceremony. I bur burn the cards, the, the poker chips, all, you know, we get rid of all that stuff. No lotto, no going to the casino, no, all right, that's all bad. Bad, 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 right? And so now I'm interacting with a, a coworker, right? And they've, they've got a lotto ticket. And, and they say, oh, you know, I, I'm, I'm waiting to, to hear, you know. Well, how am I likely to respond to my coworker who's made in the image of God and is gloriously a, a bearer of God's image? Shame. Condemnation, shame on you. You are evil, vile, and wicked. I therefore declare with the prophets that you shall die. Right? Now, we probably don't say that except that our face probably does, right? And, and so if we're married to the law rather than to Christ, right, my whole, my whole identity as a follower of Christ has been yoked to a rule that says we cannot gamble because that's evil, right? instead of I am a wicked gambler right I might not play the lottery I may not play poker I may never own a car a deck of cards in my life but I gamble all the time by the decisions that I make right I put my money in a, in a Roth IRA instead of that 401k, and that is a gamble. It's me looking at things and saying, I think I can know the future better, or that this is a wiser investment. We dress it up in all kinds of different language, right? But by my putting my money in this thing and not that thing, what am I doing? I'm gambling because I'm saying I will secure my retirement, I will do what's good, I will, right? And if I understand that my identity is not in Christ because I don't gamble like the wicked heathen do, right? But I am in Christ because of his grace that I don't deserve as a wicked, wretched gambler. And that the only way that I will ever be delivered from my gambling is because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross. Then when I encounter my friend, my neighbor, my coworker with a lotto ticket, I don't look on them as scum. I look on them and say, yeah, I, that's me. Right? Our identity is in Christ, not in how good we are in keeping rules, not in our ability to mortify the flesh or vivify the spirit, right? If our identity is in Christ, then we are free understanding that more and more to discover areas of our lives where we didn't even know that we were sinning. Have you had this experience yet as a Christian? Right? There are all kinds of things that if I had realized as a 20-something that were sin, right, I would have gone screaming into the night because I was just having a hard time, you know, as a college student, just not getting hooked into pornography, 
right? And, and so if I realize the extent of which my whole desire for a wife to please my needs was utterly sinful and wretched, not just the way that I was tempted in this way or that way, right? So now being married, what are we married now? 20, oh, what's it, 19. So that's 24, we'll be 24, 23 years, 23 and a half years, right? <laughs> okay. I go by the age of our oldest son, add a year. That's right. All right, Dolly's 22, 23. Okay, yeah, good. All right, 23 years, right? <laughs> Guys, there are ways in which I'm realizing the extent of my sinful heart in not caring for my bride. I'm desperately wicked. It is only because of God's grace, right? So I don't go around saying, okay, to be identified with Christ, you have to have family values and you have to be part of this group and do these things and then you're, you're a Christian. And if you're not, boy, you're terrible, 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 right? We encountered somebody who's divorced. <gasps> Don't you know that God hates divorce? Yeah, he hates divorce. And he hates your wicked self-righteousness in only being married once. <laughs> right? Dying to our flesh is a moment-by-moment -moment reality that if we will enter into and ask the Holy Spirit, reveal to me, take the scales off my eyes, show me the depth, the horror of the ways that I profane you, Lord Christ. He will, and he will show us mercy so that the deeper that we go, the more that we run down that rabbit trail and realize the depth of our sin, the greater will we see the heights of Christ's love for us. Satan is always telling us as the accuser, if God knew this about you, if your wife knew this about you, if your family knew this about you, and Jesus comes and says, I know it all. Don't you near, no, brother or sister, Jesus knows it far better than you do and has died for you and risen from the dead for you to know his resurrection life. So when that temptation comes, you can say, not a chance. Are you kidding me? I'm not going to roll around in that pig trough anymore. Christ has died for me. I don't have to do that anymore. Holy Spirit, enable me to die to that and to live to you. So that's the arena in which then we get to all these other things, right? That the the Westminster Confession helps us to, to wrestle through these things, and these three points in particular I want us to, to understand. That sanctification necessarily, and I have that underlined, necessarily follows calling and regeneration of the new believer. We, we spend so much time trying to, to work on sanctification when folks aren't regenerate, right? So the old classic line, you gotta, you gotta catch the fish before you clean it, Right? You know, so often we think, you know, oh, look, so-and-so showed up at church. Oh, poor dear, doesn't she know she shouldn't dress like that? Knock it off. Yeah, we'll get to discipling them after we have actually wrestled through the grace of God and can demonstrate that to them, or whatever the thing is. Right? That it's not, oh, poor dear, don't they know, but it's what is wrong with me? Why would I respond that way? Lord, help me to be gracious. 
Help me to show the grace and mercy that you've shown me. All right, so sanctification necessarily follows calling and regeneration of the new believer. The new heart and spirit in the believer grow in holiness by the work of Christ, right? And that's a synergistic work. It's Christ working. It is us working along with him. And it's the work of Christ, the word, and the Holy Spirit. All of these at work in us. This process involves both vivification, that is life, of the spirit and mortification or putting to death of the flesh. I will not seek my own safety. I will not seek my own name. I will not seek my own whatever, but rather I will seek the glory of Christ. I will choose to live in ways that honor him. I will choose to live in ways that are caring and sacrificing for others. This growth in grace leads to holy living, not self-righteousness, but holy living as befits those who dwell with the holy God, right? God is holy and has declared for us to be holy as well. So second, our sanctification is simultane- simultaneously thorough, right? It's, it's all of us. We have, we have already been made perfectly righteous in Christ and simultaneously yet incomplete, right? We're hopefully getting more and more made in the image of Christ as we grow. That by God's grace, I'm much more aware of my own sin and repentant and trusting in Christ now than I was 10 years ago. On, on that, here's another uh, way that, that I think it's important for us to understand the way that this works, right? Is, is that as I mortify the flesh and, and die to, to uh, myself and, and live for Christ, right? That, that there, it's not just... It, it, it's, it's not my, my growth in Christ is, well, I kind of grow and I, I, you know, and then I, you know, it is this, but it's also this cycle, right? That, that as I'm doing this, that leads to greater growth in the spirit and that, that as I'm spiraling up, I can also disobey and spiral down, right? And, and so I'm constantly getting off this ramp and then getting off this ramp and, you know, so that, that it, there's this spiraling up and down. But what we don't find in this is any real plateau, right? I'm, the, the Lord uses his word. His word never returns void. And so it's constantly at work in us, either hardening us to his word or softening us to it. Right? And so we constantly find this kind of spiraling up, spiraling down, right? but very, very little just hanging out the same, same level. Okay? So it's simultaneously thorough, all of us, and yet incomplete that, that I'm continuing to, to stutter and uh, struggle with these, these things in this life, which is the reason for the continual and irreconcilable war within all believers that is the battle between the spirit who dwells in us and the remnants of our corruption and our flesh, right? The only time that this war is finished is when we are taken home. That we will continue to wrestle with this war the entirety of our lives. But that's the great hope, right? Is, is that when Christ comes, if we're still here, we will join him and be like him. We will no longer struggle, right? Because the next thing after sanctification is glorification, where we're made completely holy, not only in our, his declaring us so, but in our experience of it. We'll have resurrected bodies that no longer decay. All right, and then last, while our flesh may at times much prevail in this war, Christ continues to grant us grace, and the Spirit of Christ will and does continue to perfect us in a holy fear of God, right? This is one of the reasons why it's so important that we have classes like this to deal with the knowledge of what the Scripture says on this, but that we can never just have a class and go, okay, great, got it, we're all doing it, right? But why it's so important that we have men's ministries and women's ministries. I hope that you guys will take advantage. I know the women's ministry is having a retreat coming up in the end of March. What is it? Middle of March? March. Yeah, March 21st, 2nd, somewhere in there. So women, let me encourage you, go to the retreat. Talk with other women from the church. Be open and honest that this is your struggle. 
right? That, that that's not something to shy away from, but rather to be honest with, because every other person here is struggling in the same way. Maybe with different things, right? And if they don't admit it, they're lying. So be gracious to them, right? Don't, don't holler at them, just be gracious, okay? Guys, there's a great opportunity coming up at the beginning, first weekend in April. We're gonna go over to, to Maine and do some construction so we can ar, ar, have a great time as, as guys. But we're also just gonna eat together and enjoy time uh, together. And so we'd love to have you part of that. But, but you also need to be doing that on a regular basis, right? That's why the Taking Gathered Worship home is so important, that we're every day in His Word, reading and studying and praying, that, that we do that in small groups, and we're going to be doing some training for small group facilitators in March, and then uh, doing some more small groups in, in April and, and following Easter. So all of these things, Christ, by His Word and His Spirit, together with His people, helps us work through these things, that His name might be glorified. Let me pray. Father, thank You for Your goodness and grace to us. Thank You for winning the war and so calling us into battle that we would die to ourselves and live for You. We pray, Lord Jesus, in Christ's name. Amen. Pastor. Yeah.